Hi, my name's Pete Knapp, an Air Quality PhD student at Imperial College London. This series of podcasts is kindly promoted by the Grantham Institute, the college's hub for climate change and environment. Subscribe to receive future episodes and contact the Grantham Institute on Twitter with at Grantham underscore IC and me with at Pete K underscore AQ. This is Tipping Points, a podcast featuring interviews with people who have become environmental activists. What made them change? What are they doing now? And what do they hope to see in the future as we face possible breakdown of civilization and life on Earth? This first series focuses on scientists in the UK. With me in this episode is Dr. Scott Archer Nichols from Leeds. Welcome. Hi there. All right then, Scott. In three minutes, I'd like you to give me your life story. I'm an undergrad in physics, but I did a PhD at the University of Manchester. I had this, got a subscription to New Scientist when I was about 16. And it was over a couple of months, I kind of had this realisation that like, basically every single week, there would be two or three articles about climate change and about environmental degradation and things like that and how serious it was. And this feeling that it just wasn't really appearing anywhere else, but it was this like huge topic within the scientific fields and no one else was really talking about it. And I started reading a lot of sort of pop science books about it, getting to the point where I got quite freaked out about it quite young, similar kind of age as Greta was these days, but there obviously was like nothing going on at that time in terms of protest movements. I mean, at university, I did actually get into environmental protesting for a while. There was like a protest that I went to at Drax Power Station. And I got, kind of got a bit frustrated with the protest movements at the time. I thought they were a bit insular, a bit sort of inward looking and not really thinking big enough to sort of have a big shift on this. So I kind of went off from that path and decided to sort of focus much more on research. I decided I wanted to do a PhD in something related to climate change. So it's this very sort of niche section of climate science, which is all to do with how short-lived pollutants affect climate change. So it's very focused on things like how aerosols, which is very small particles in the air, can affect clouds and how those clouds can change. These processes are some of the sort of one of the main reasons why it's very difficult to predict how the climate is going to change in the future. The focus in the end was on aerosols from biomass burning in the Amazon. I did a short postdoc after I finished that in Boulder in Colorado, which was more focused on air quality. And then I wanted to come back to the UK. And so I started doing a postdoc in Cambridge, which is where I've been ever since. And so my current project is on the main model, which the Met Office use to do the climate simulations, which get used in the IPCC reports. Uh, And I just kind of work on this sort of little subsection of that, which is how the chemical processes in the atmosphere can affect climate change. For a lot of that time, I would say I was not particularly hopeful that we were going to solve climate change. I kind of had this general feeling that we weren't really going to face up to it until the impacts of climate change were upon us. And I couldn't really see how governments would make large enough changes. I thought there was just too much entrenched power. Paris came along in 2016, which was nice. It is quite monumental that a negotiation like that, which involves you know, so many countries in the world, is quite remarkable. But I still had this sort of feeling that it was too little too late. You know, around that time, like 2015, 2016, 2017, there were a lot of these reports saying, you know, CO2 that emissions have stopped going up. Um, and there was a few years where people thought, oh, maybe that we've peaked. And it got to about 2018. And then suddenly emissions went up for like by about 2.8% in 2018. I thought, well, look, in 2010, when I first started my PhD, I did not think that in six, seven, eight years time that emissions would still be growing. Like we knew when I was 16 that CO2 emissions needed to start coming down. Since the IPCC was founded in 1990, emissions have gone up by about 60%. Is just doing science 
going to be enough because that's what people, scientists have been doing for decades and it hasn't been enough so far. We thought two degrees might have been safe. Actually, even one and a half degrees isn't really that safe. Like even the impacts of one and a half degrees can be really bad. And we were really starting to see these impacts of one degree, just one degree of warming above pre-industrial levels. You know, we were starting to have a load of like a string of really weird summers where it was just really blisteringly hot. And then Manchester got flooded and I'd never known Manchester to be flooded and there was fires in California. But was there a single event that gave you that wake up call? That report was quite a big impact for me. I think both in terms of like how it really spelled out the impacts at different levels of warming, but also about how it really drilled into how short amount of time we have to deal with the issue if we are going to avoid those worst levels of warming, if we are going to keep to the Paris Agreement. Uh, I mean, that report is where this whole thing about 12 years to save the climate comes from. The idea of that really is that if we're going to keep to 1.5 degrees, emissions of carbon dioxide globally have to halve by 2030. And we are just not doing anything like that. I mean, emissions, like I said, are still going up. They might have dipped this year due to COVID, but they're certainly not going down at the kind of rates we would need to see. I mean, I think at two degrees of warming, it said that all coral reefs would go. I think I see that as being a real failure. I think the other side of it, of what happened around that time, was really, first of all, Greta Thunberg um, doing school strikes, which happened in the, started in the summer of 2018. And I think that was when I first appreciated, you know, what the, for, you really saw that the younger generation was getting very angry with this and going on strikes. And I think what they're doing is completely justified. But I also see that them having to do that as being a bit of a failure of our generation and the generation immediately above me. And was it those school strikes that made you think about joining Extinction Rebellion? Yes. I think the school strikes were the first to come along that really made me think, I feel like I need to be doing something beyond just research to try and deal with, tackle this. I would say I didn't. So I think I started following Extinction Rebellion on the news, but I was a bit apprehensive about being involved for a while. What, uh, what made you apprehensive? Um, that's a good question. There has definitely been messaging from Extinction Rebellion, which I think goes a bit beyond the science at times. It becomes a bit alarmist and a bit doomist. And so when I was reading some stuff in the news, it was like, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd read it and go, ah, going a bit too far, that's not really a fair interpretation. And I could see why they're doing it. It's like, it's a pushback against a lot of what was considered to be good climate science communication previously, which was very sort of hope focused. You always had to end on an optimistic note. Uh, I think what Extinction Rebellion, I think we're trying to do is really just sound the alarm. And to be honest with you, I do actually agree that you need to have that. I think we've gotten to the point now where the kind of changes that we need to deal with climate change are so great that I can't really see how we can mobilise country and get those changes to happen without there being a bit of fear. I think the other thing is the 2025 demands is something that I've had difficulty with simply because I don't see how it is possible to achieve that. I think it requires such a huge and rapid turnaround. The thing that kind of turn me around. Isn't it weird that we have these massive protests which are really based on our understanding that has been developed through you know, about 150 years of climate science and yet scientists are absent. And I also notice, you know, talking about with other scientists in my department about it, there's often this common feeling that people are like, oh, I'm glad that Extinction Rebellion or I'm glad that Fridays for the Future exists because they've been able to push it up the agenda, but don't necessarily want to be involved in it. And then they'd get annoyed or start, you know, bad mouthing them for getting the science one. And I sort of think, well, actually, maybe that's partly our responsibility. Like if this stuff is complicated, if you want the messaging to be better, maybe we need to get out there and help the messaging. And this is when you decided to bridge the gap between activism and the science. You were one of the co-founders of Scientists for XR, or or XRS as it's sometimes known. 
When did this start and how have you seen it develop? When I was down there in April, I ran into someone who I said, you know, I'm a scientist. I'd like to try and help a bit with some, some of the messaging. And she gave me the number to this guy called Alan Cherry, who was already involved. And he added me to this WhatsApp group. At the time, it was a fairly disorganized rabble. I think we sort of decided that we kind of wanted to become a bit more self-organized and like have our own little group of scientists, organize some of our own protests, organize some of our own actions. That's when sort of Scientists for XR started. It was done in the same model as uh, Doctors for XR, which had started up like a few months before us. We wrote a declaration which was saying, you know, as scientists, we are deeply concerned about this and we support nonviolent direct action to raise political response to the emergency. And then we also had the group of scientists who just weren't necessarily experts in either sort of climate or ecology, but were just very concerned about climate crisis and who wanted to organise protests to do that as a, as a block. And the idea there being more that like people respect scientists. If scientists are showing that they are very concerned about this and are prepared to take action against it, it that can lend credibility to the movement and it can, you know, it's quite a, a big way of raising the profile. And so I kind of kind of see it as being those those are sort of two wings. So you had this like loosely organized um, emergency science group, and you had this scientists for XR who are doing actions. People got a bit confused about the distinction we decided to merge it all together which was how Extinction Rebellion scientists or XRS formed um, and part of that was also that we we're trying to organize to become more international. Yeah so it has grown beyond the UK borders. Yeah we basically just people just came to us really I think once when we got to October we started doing a few actions which got some press we had hundreds of scientists come in and say they wanted to be involved being we got over 1,500 people signing the declaration that we wrote. And we realised that there's this actually quite a lot of scientists out there who are really concerned about this. And they often don't really see that when you're within a university. It often feels like there aren't that many scientists who are prepared to do that. Um, but there's plenty out there. It was all a bit overwhelming, really. <laughs> it was like thousands of people have signed the declaration hundreds of people have signed up to try and be more involved but it's always been a struggle to get more than a you know 20 30 people active really getting the organization to do that has been tricky i think particularly with scientists um the majority of us have got full-time jobs has it become overwhelming to the point where you've maybe thought of giving up <sighs> I don't know about giving up completely. I have definitely had to take extended breaks. Like I've had periods where, you know, I've just signed out for a month or two at a time and not really going out and seeing other people. I think I found that quite hard because it was like all these boundaries weren't really there between the sort of uh, work and XR and what have you. But I'd, I'd say the group has definitely struggled during lockdown. We've got a lot of retired scientists. I think they're, they're often the people who have the most time to commit. And a lot of them just say, well, I'm, I'm shielding, you know, I can't, I can't do anything on the street and it's perfectly reasonable. Uh, I think we've also had people who've just, you know, maybe their mental health hasn't been great during lockdown. I've, I don't know, I've certainly struggled with that a few times during lockdown because it has been tough. So it's quickly after you started that you became an XRS fact checker. Did this make you feel like you had to up your game in what you read about? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and did your interest then change as you were reading more? Yeah, I think that really you know, in this WhatsApp group that we had where like papers are just being shared constantly, you're reading these things and that sort of, yeah, it really did sort of broaden my perspectives in a way that it hasn't done for a while. So you asked that question about why is it that I think that maybe many scientists aren't as active as you might think that they should be, given the issues that we are. There's, there's many answers to that question, but I think one of them is that there's a huge pressure to specialise in 
a, a, a niche area within whatever your field is. And I think it's really from appreciating the big picture that you realise how bad a situation that we're actually in. Now, focusing a little bit more on you personally, when you've had conversations with your friends and family about the climate and ecological emergency, how has it been? <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to be honest with you, I actually find it quite difficult to talk about it with with friends and family a lot of the time. I find that, you know, it can be a bit of a downer, you know, to put it, <laughs> to put it bluntly. You know, I don't know many people who absolutely deny that climate change exists. Most people say, oh yeah, it's a problem, but won't really want to think about it that more deeply. And I, I think the thing that one of the things I'm sort of worried about is this kind of, you know, thinking that, oh, other people are worrying about it, it's going to be dealt with. Um, when actually I think you, you really do need to have this large scale popular support for changes to happen in, each, in all the first changes to stick. Uh, yeah, I do talk about it with my partner occasionally. I've had a few conversations with my parents. I think my parents are actually like really clued up now and they've, they've really gotten into it. So they're very into um, things like ideas like rewilding. And also I need to have time off. Like I can't, I can't be thinking about this all the time. It's not good for my health. I feel frustrated with myself because I feel like, oh, I should be talking about this more, but I don't always want to. Um, and then I feel guilty for not talking about it more because I think it's the most important thing that we should be talking about. Now, talking a bit more about guilt, if you did something or ate something that had a big impact on your carbon footprint, how do you deal with that? I wouldn't say that I live like a perfectly low carbon lifestyle. I try not to sort of attack myself too much about things like that because at the end of the day, I don't think that this is a problem that individuals can deal with. One of the things I often find is that conversations will get steered in certain directions, um, which I don't always necessarily think are helpful. Um, so one of the things is like people will often start talking about this and people will think that it's an attack on their behavior and say, oh, but I do recycling. Oh, I do this, I do that. And I often feel like, sure great but actually the focus really needs to be on what are how do we do these large macroeconomic shifts away from fossil fuels rather than that focus on like what are you as an individual doing but it's mostly because i think people will trust something if it's not coming from someone who's acting hypocritically rather than because i believe that my actions as an individual have much of an impact Ironically, a lot of the people who do have those abilities to make choices are often more well off, often have a higher carbon footprint than people that you may consider to not be able to make those kind of choices. When you, when you dig into it, flying is often the biggest portion of someone's carbon footprint, but only, what is it, like 15% of people make 70% of the flights? We heard the term um, affluenza. You know, it's like 50% of the emissions in the world come from 10% of the people. You could have a lot of people who can get very hung up about their carbon footprints, but actually it's the small minority of people who live very affluent lives. But this rise of like flexitarianism, people who are not necessarily being hardcore vegetarian or vegan, but cutting down the amount of their meat, that's become a lot more acceptable now. Whereas I think previously it felt like it was a very black and white issue. Like people would either be hardcore vegetarian, hardcore vegan or not at all. And there wasn't really considered to be a middle ground. I think it's much better to have, you know, half the country cut that meat late by 80% than to have, you know, 5% cut it out completely. And I think these kind of shifts have a much larger impact on what companies and, but then, you know, the idea of the carbon footprint was I think it was developed by Shell. And I think there, there, there's a psychological element as well, but if you like focus too much on the, the individual action, people blame themselves and they blame other people rather than blaming 
the companies and blaming the governments which allow them to operate, which is the sort of bigger bigger picture cause. A lot of people's emissions, we don't have a huge amount of control over. Like many of them are rented property and we've got single glazed windows. And that's a huge problem because it means you have to have the heating on a lot. And I'd much rather not, but there's not much that I could really do about that. And I think this is one of the things about like the, how inequality creeps into it. Like you have a lot of people in low incomes who have actually got a much smaller footprint than someone who's more affluent, but what footprint they have, they have very little control over. Most of that is dictated by the infrastructure that's around them and what they can afford. Whereas someone who's more affluent might have a larger footprint and could actually do more to t take that down, and they probably should do. People who are on lower incomes, I really wouldn't recommend them thinking about too much about their own personal carbon footprint. I think they should be thinking about power structures and how to change that and how to change the options that they have available. Like people sort of say things like only oh, middle class people care about climate change and that's, you know, it's completely rubbish. It's just a lot more difficult for people to make individual changes if they if they don't have the wealth to. But at the same time, I also don't think they have the same responsibility to. Yeah. Now, I assume that you watched David Attenborough programmes when you were growing up. How did they affect you? You know, I remember watching Blue Planet and the coral reefs are just the most incredible ecosystems under the water. They're like the Amazon of the sea, right? I just felt that it was just criminal that people would consider that less than two degrees of warming could be considered a reasonable or safe level of warming if that is going to mean that this, e this most amazing ecosystem in the world is going to be completely wiped out. Let's be clear about this. We are well on track for that happening. Like we are going to have to really turn the ship around if we want to save the coral reefs in any way outside of aquariums. Um, it, it really is that serious. And yeah, is the recent um, series that he's done where it's sort of joining the dots and sort of showing how human impacts are having such a big impact on the natural environment, I think are key. Have you seen any of that firsthand? I think when I was in Brazil, it's probably the most, most dramatic, really. We had like a small research aircraft, which was flying over the region, taking in samples of the air, uh, flying over where they're having forest fires. And the forest fires were generally occurring for uh, people clearing the forest for farmlands. So mostly either for cattle farming or for uh, growing soy, which is used to feed cattle, primarily. When you're down there in the ground or just flying low, low over it, A, you, you can't really get an appreciation just how huge the Amazon rainforest is. Like, it is absolutely mind-boggling. You can just be going over an area and it's just horizon to horizon trees. Um, and obviously, you know, that's just like one tiny little corner of it. Um, and then you just keep going over it and then there's this like hard line and you go over there and you're in a cerrado which is what, what they call like the savanna most of those are really just there for cattle it is literally just like a line in the sand where on one side of it is one man controlled environment and the other side of it is rainforest and that line is just moving as the roads cut through um and how did that affect you when you saw it firsthand I don't know. It's it's it made me appreciate, you know, on the one hand, why people could think that the Amazon is goes on forever, where you couldn't you could just keep exploiting it because it is just so big that you can't really quite comprehend it. But at the same time, you you look at the maps where you look at how big it was in the eighties and how big it is now, and these things changing like they are. Um, you know, it is really scary. Like now that since Bolsonaro has come into power in Brazil and, you know, it's moving back on a lot of the good progress that had been being made in the previous decades, you know, rates of deforestation are back up there with what they were at the peak in the mid 2000s. And, you know, 
when you take that big picture, I would say I'm more scared about the health of the Amazon now than I was when I was actually there. And when you saw the deforestation for soy and animal grazing, did this make you think more about what you ate? Yeah, I think that that's the thing is that I think I, I was vegetarian at the time, but I think I had this real blind spot for dairy. And it's interesting how long it took me to sort of really appreciate that. I don't think, I remember what I was thinking then was that I was with those scientists. Well, in Brazilian cuisine, is very meat focused. Uh, it's like Brazilian barbecues is a huge part of the culture. Um, and I found it really odd, like how, how much meat was being consumed when we had just been out seeing what, what kind of impact that was having. But then I was a real blind spot around dairy. And I think that stayed with me until I read a book called Sapiens. I mean, he's, he's vegan. It has a section in there about really talking about what happens in dairy farms. And I was already well aware that, you know, the environmental impact of eating cheese is not that much better than eating beef. And so I just thought, you know what, this is, there are too many contradictions here. Um, I'm going to try and go vegan. And I found me going cold turkey vegan really difficult. Um, but then I think what happened afterwards is that I started to take things out of my diet one by one and then learn how to adjust to that. And then I found that became a lot easier. And so I found that, you know, replace milk with oat milk. Um, I've started like stopping having cheese, but toasting seeds and having that on things like pasta. And that actually, even though it's quite different, it satisfies me in a different way. Shifting the focus onto the States, you spent some time in Colorado, you say. Uh, how do Americans talk about the climate? And how do you feel about Biden's recent pledges and plans? So I knew statistics like that the average American had about double the carbon footprint of the average European. Um, I didn't really appreciate what that looked like until I was there. But it's such a card focus culture meat is a much bigger part of the diet as well um people fly around within the states a lot it feels a lot more ingrained there's a lot more sort of high energy dependency there within how people live their lives um and i don't think people necessarily see that because i think it's just wherever you grow up you sort of appreciate that as being normal i think one of the useful things about living in another country is it's sort of a, a, you sort of see what other people consider normal, but then you also reflect on these oddities that you have growing up in your life, which maybe other people wouldn't really consider normal. So it's, it's, I think you can definitely learn a lot from living in other places. Where I was in, Col in Colorado, the main thing I appreciated there was being close to national parks, so like the Rocky Mountain National Park. And I think that really made me appreciate how ecologically degraded a lot of places in the UK are um, like our we really don't have much virgin forest or like untamed landscape even a lot of the places that we were considered to be wild like the Peak District or the Lake District actually have been inhabited for by humans for thousands of years and they're quite artificial landscapes because you know well sheep didn't originate in the UK that's the main thing that you're going to see on the hills. You're going to see all these bare hills where the forests have been taken down and you've just got sheep roaming them. Um, that's not a natural environment, right? It's a man-controlled environment. Um, whereas I felt like in America, you've got these huge national parks where they it feels a lot more wild and there's a lot more um, large wildlife. Like you can just go around the corner and see a moose. It's amazing. And I, it's, that's, I think that was probably my favourite part of living there, to be honest with you. Uh, and, and in terms of uh, Biden's plans and pledges? I'm actually quite impressed, if I'm going to be honest with you. The thing which I like about what Biden has done compared to, for example, the recent 10-point plan by Boris Johnson, is that a lot of his pleasures are focused on 
tackling the actual oil and gas industry. And I think one of the things, you, one of the important things to appreciate in terms of how we have to deal with the climate crisis is that, I mean, it may sound really stupid here, but this often does get missed, which is that if we want to stop climate change, we have to stop emitting carbon dioxide. If we want to stop emitting carbon dioxide, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. And if you want to stop burning fossil fuels, the best way to do that is to just not dig them up in the ground in the first place. I think in terms of what the 10 point planet Boris has talked about, it's been very focused on, oh, we're going to build more offshore wind, we're going to have more electric cars, we're going to uh, have greener houses, what have you. But then they're also approving the new Cumbria coal mine. They're still searching for oil in the North Sea. Whereas what Biden and statements have made, they've been, well, axing the pipeline, which running from oil sands in Canada is some of the most ecologically destructive industries that are on the planet because it's tearing down virgin forests up there where we really, really need that forest to draw carbon out of that sort of atmosphere. And then developing this very energy intensive, very dirty oil and gas, which, you know, has huge issues for water um, in the area and local pollution. The limiting factor has often been actually getting the oil to places where it can be refined. And so by building a pipeline that massively reduces the costs of getting that oil and gas processed. And so if you allow that to the pipeline to be developed, that massively opens up the possibility for developing oil from that region, uh, which might not be possible otherwise. People have been trying to build this for decades. It's had a huge amount of resistance. Indigenous communities, both in Canada and states of America, where the pipeline is passing through their territories, have mounted massive protests against it. And eventually it you know, got to the point where it was axed by Obama, but then it was started up again by Trump. And so Biden axing it as one of his first things is really important. I think that can be like really hold back the development of tar sands. But then he's also said that he wants to block all new oil and gas on federal land. I believe he's blocking uh, oil and gas developments in, in Alaska, in the Northern Arctic. I think those are the kind of things which are actually going to get us in the right direction, more so than just funding new technologies, just funding new renewable energy. If you just focus on that, you can easily get in a situation where you just add that on top of the other fossil fuel infrastructure that we have. And so we just have more renewables energy and more gas energy being green in terms of saving the climate are only as useful as much as they displace other forms of energy which are more polluting. And so I think if you really want to tackle this, you need to have you have to have both a carrot and a stick. You need to encourage alternatives and you need to tackle the problem. And I think one of the one of the traps that a lot of like environmental legislation and even a lot of environmentalists get into is they only focus on the solutions and don't think about tackling the issues. Yeah, so lots of uh, different countries are taking different approaches with this and we've got the COP26 coming up in November this year, the gathering of world leaders in Glasgow. And that's going to be an opportunity for the UK to show the world that we can do what it takes to avert the worst effects of the climate crisis. Uh, do you think we are? <laughs> um, as, short answer is no. Um, I think we're starting to go in the right direction. There has been big shifts in language in the last two years. I just don't think that we are putting in place the actual policies to make it happen yet. It's very easy for things like this to turn into a bit of a big festival of greenwash, as it were. I think the UK should be aiming for a target for 2050, to be honest with you, in terms of net zero. Where that comes from is this idea that if we're going to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, then the world, the entire world's emissions need to reach net zero by 2050. And that has come from this IPCC report in 2018. But I don't think that that one piece of information by itself is sufficient. I think there's, if you dig into it, it's, the picture is more complicated than that. 
And one of the key things is that it, for that 2050 target to be valid, first of all, the world needs to peak emissions now um, and then more or less half by 2030. The other, the other factor is that if we want the whole world to need that zero by 2050, the richer countries are going to have to be at the head of that curve. And so if you want the global average to be getting to net zero by 2050, then I think countries like the UK and the US and the rest of the EU, Australia, what have you, really need to be getting to net zero a decade or two before that, and probably aiming to be net negative at that point to allow for the fact that there's going to be a lot of other countries in the world which just don't have the ability to change technologies fast enough to get there. Either that or we need to be providing more economic support for those countries to transition and adapt to climate change. In doing so, we also don't want to just be focusing on the emissions which originate within this country. We also want to be thinking about what are the emissions associated with what we consume. The 2050 has become a bit of a soundbite and I find it a bit frustrating because I think it doesn't quite cover the full breadth of the problem and I honestly don't think that the UK sticking with the 2050 target is going to be enough to avoid the worst impacts of warming. Having said that, I do appreciate that we were the first country to make that statement. There's a strong argument to say that there's not a, an advantage in being way ahead of the pack. Like if you were to do a really, really extreme transition, but the rest of the world was going to carry on as it were, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to harm yourself economically relative to them. And you're still going to have global warming because we only deal with quite a small slice of the pie ourselves in terms of those emissions. And so if you want to move things forward, you kind of need to get a kind of critical mass of countries to all push their targets forward. And so I'd say at the moment, what's kind of happened is things have actually shifted quite a bit in the last year, year and a half, in that, you know, the UK did 2050 target, EU did a 2050 target, we've got, China's got a 2060 target now, US has just put in step for 2050 target. That's enough to have a bit of a critical mass that there are the countries that are moving forward that it has changed what we predict is the most likely warming by the end of the century from about three degrees to being more like about 2.5 degrees, which is a good movement. But I think we all have to be honest that that is still way off what is actually needed for meeting the Paris Agreement target of well below two degrees. And we've seen China really cutting their carbon emissions down. Do you think that that's politically motivated or do you think that maybe they, they think that they're coastline cities are going to be underwater i think china sees climate change as being a security issue i think they see it as being a threat to their ability to hold power but i also think that they don't see the point in setting targets unless they know that the west is going to also cut their emissions and actually cut their emissions faster and i think the west should be cutting their emissions faster because we developed a lot earlier than them and we've got the capacity to cut our emissions faster um, and so this is what I mean about the kind of step forward it's like now that the EU and the US and China have made these commitments if we want it to move forward then we need to be making that step forward as well and then hopefully then the EU can make a step forward the US can make a step forward but I would say it's not just it's not just about the net zero date and I think this is this, the key thing is that I think it's more important what happens within the next 10 years necessarily than when you say you're going to be getting to net zero if that's going to be in like the middle of the century because there's so many there's so much time between now and then when things can change we could say we're going to get to net zero in 2050 we might get closer to and panic and say actually we're going to try and go for 2040 and what have you but if we actually want to keep to like a safe budget, we really need to be cutting emissions now. Like we need to be putting into policy that means we're going to have significant emission reductions within the next 10 years. And I think that's, that's the thing that I, I feel is a bit missing from a lot of these statements. We need to keep the focus on what our politicians going to be doing, what our government's going to be doing in this political term to get us in that direction. How are we going to, 
how are we going to cut things in the next five, 10 years? And that's kind of where I get frustrated. I feel like there's, there's not enough movement in those directions. Like, yeah, countries are starting to put in their targets for 2030, but there's still not enough to meet the Paris Agreement. And what would you say to a scientist who might be listening to this, wanting to do something, but they're just not sure what? I think you need to ask yourself what you are comfortable doing. I think that's important. I appreciate there are many different lines that you can take with this. Probably depends on what stage in your career you're at as well. One of the things that I kind of feel is that going down the traditional route of being a scientist, even one who is maybe working with policy or working with policymakers or being more on that sort of public communication front, it can take quite a long time between what you're doing in your research to have an impact on the policy world, probably 10 or 20 years before you can reach that kind of position where you have a big influence. And so I, I kind of feel that just in terms of when I was born and what generation I'm in, I don't feel like I could have a huge influence going down that route within the next 10 years. And I really do feel like the next 10 years are critical if we're going to be avoiding the worst impacts of climate change and keeping to the Paris Agreement. And so that's one of the reasons why I felt like going down more of an activist route is actually quite a good, important thing for scientists to do. Now, if someone is already in that kind of position where they have links to government or they can talk with them and they feel like those links might be threatened if they take more activist routes. I could totally understand it if they think that it's more important that they manage to maintain that position and that role. But I think if you're sort of younger or if you've retired, then I could I would probably say that you would have more influence thinking about either being an activist or helping activists. And I think there's a lot of support roles that scientists can have, even if they're not prepared to be arrested. I think a lot of our members uh, in Scientists of XR, for whatever reason, don't want to be arrested. And that's okay, because there's just having more scientists who are prepared to just talk with activists and explain science and sort of just give them support about what they're doing is right, I think is a really important role. But then I also think that having more scientists who are prepared to go out into the street and showing that they, you know, something about this really needs to be done. That's something which is different and could have more of an impact. And I really would like to see more scientists, you know, being prepared to take that action. And finally, then, how would you encourage scientists to become activists? I think try and lead by example, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, I think it has, it has been very rewarding doing this, doing the emergency on planet Earth. We've had so much good feedback from people saying that it's really helpful to be able to read that we've also been sharing it with people who do communication with xr we've had other external scientists who previously were quite critical of xr messaging saying oh actually this is this is really good if you stick to this then we will support what you're saying on twitter and social media and that's been really encouraging because we you know i think you can stick to the science and still have a very urgent alarming message and i think we've tried to be very clear about that I know that a lot of scientists don't have that activist background, so the activist cultures can seem quite alien, quite different. I think that's a very good way of getting involved and helping where maybe not, not so far out of the comfort zone. Activist groups are quite different to the scientific world, as it were. But I'll also just say, like, I've always found the majority of people in XR are just very friendly, very nice people who are just worried. And I think they've got really good reason to be worried. And it's really helpful for them just to have scientists involved who are prepared to just speak about it honestly. And I find that it's very sort of mutually helpful. We're limited a bit by COVID still, but as soon as that stops, we're going to start doing stuff on the ground again. And we're going to be doing larger protests, but we'll also be doing a lot of outreach on the streets and we'll be doing actions. And I think just whatever level of those, that spectrum that you're comfortable with, come out and help. Wonderful. Well, with that, Dr. Scott Archer Nichols, thank you very much. Music from Climate by Eric Ian Walker. 
commissioned by the Climate Music Project. We communicate the sense of urgency of the climate and ecological crises through the emotional power of music. More to be found at ericinwalker.bandcamp.com and climatemusic.org.